Hi, my name is Yeti Tabai, also known as TSG That Small Girl. Yeti is the name, TSG That Small Girl is the brand. And today we're going to be talking about a question that so many women, so many women ask, ask me about. And that question is how to set up a food business from your home. How to set up a food business from your home. Um... Usually, the, the people come up to me and they're asking, which is, you know what, I'm not interested in running a restaurant. It's too tedious, too much red tape. It's, it's, it's not something they're interested in. But the question is, even though you're running a food business from your home, you would still have to answer to the local council. You still would have to answer questions. You still have to go through some red tape, whether you like it or not. And as you can imagine, nothing good comes easy. So my question is, before you go off to that bank, asking for a loan to start a business why not just start with what you have to the best of my understanding most people that want to start a food business have a house to themselves or you might be renting or you have a little space to yourself that you probably have a cooker because at the end of the day every human's need and basic need is food shelter and clothing so by default if you have those things food and you have enough to feed yourself and you have enough to feed somebody else probably you're a woman out there and you have a family uh, and if you don't have a family you're a single woman and you're thinking about getting into the catering business or you're getting thinking of getting into the hospitality business of um, running a restaurant by all means I think it's something that any woman can do any woman and when I when I'm speaking about women Please, guys, if you're, <laughs> if you're out there, don't feel ostracized. This also applies to guys out there as well. You can run a catering business from your home. And when I say catering business, it's typically you cook food at home and you could deliver it to the members of the community or you could have people pick it up from your house. But we'll get into that conversation at a later stage. And, and the reason why I'm going through this podcast personally is I think personally I'm tired of repeating myself to different people at different points at point in time so so i i think i'm doing this personally so that there's a record somewhere so anybody that does ask me going forward oh yeti come on man how do you how do you how do you run a food business from home because when we go to your website www.yetiskitchen.com we see that about on the about us page we see that you used to have your restaurant from your house in Milton Keynes. How did you go about it? I could say, you know what, on that same page, go to the blog section and you can see a podcast that literally details everything that you need to know about running a food business from home. So, um, yeah, let's get right into it. So, my name is Yeti Tabai. Uh, how do you spell Yeti Tabai? <laughs> it is Y E T T I uh, surname. T, okay, T-A-B-A-I. I'll tell you the phonic sounds for those. Uh, phonic sounds are phonic pronunciations. I don't know, man. You know what I mean. So, Yankee, Echo, Tango, Tango, India, which is Y for Yankee, E for Echo, T for Tango, another T for Tango, and E for India. Beg your pardon. I for India. And then my surname is Tango. That's T for Tango. A for Alpha, B for Bravo, A for Alpha, and I for India. That's my name. So anytime I just search that on Google and you get to find out more about me. Or if you want to know more about all the things I do, because at the end of the day, just Yeti Tabai, you'd get to know me as a person. You get to know my private life, because personally, I'm a very, um, I'm very much an ambivert. So I'm um, not a fan of the cameras, but I love working behind the cameras. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Not a fan of the limelight. I'm not trying to get any fame because I. I love my privacy. I love walking around in my tracksuit <laughs> and my trainers and my hoodie and wearing a hat because I just like being comfortable. But I believe the minute you get famous and you're in the public eye, now you have to start looking good, put some makeup on, try and impress, look good for your future. Um, nah. Yeah, I, I think I look good already without makeup. So not. You might catch me wearing makeup every now and then. But it's because I probably have somewhere important to go to. But I like the privacy that uh, my little quiet life affords me. Um, but yeah, if you want to know me personally, it's Yeti Tabai. If you want to know more about what I do, TSG, that small girl, type that into Google. And then you get to see the plethora 
of things that I do, which is graphic design, website design, food. Um, um, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm a singer. I, I do so many things. So let's not even get into that. So I digress. So back to what you're here to listen to. So how do you run a food business from your home? So um, just a segue. If by any chance I, I finish this podcast and I have not covered anything that... So I've, I've not covered some of the things that you're thinking about. By all means, please go to the website, www.yetiskitchen.com, which is www.yettiskitchen.com. Um, on there, you would find the blog section, and there I would finally get a minute. As you can imagine, I'm a chef, so... Um, When I finally have a minute to sit by a computer, I'll definitely write down all the bullet points step by step of what you need to get a restaurant or food business run from your home. Um, And I think depending on the amount of traction I get with this, I might just make an ebook that you can download um, and we just take it from there because that way you're not having to log on online to constantly view the content. You can have the ebook to yourself. So let me know, guys. Let me know. Go in the comment section of the blog and let me know your thoughts. So, um, yeah, how to start a food business. First things first, you need to register your name. You need to register your business name. Um, There's many options. You can register the business name as a sole trader. Or you can register the business as a public, as a private limited company. Beg your pardon, not public. You can register the business as a sole trader or private limited company. If you don't know what these mean, please Google it. Um, I think everybody on here is just trying to run a business rather than get into the nitty gritty of accounting and what's the best form. But I'll tell you from my experience, I initially started out um, as a sole trader, but I found that um, it was more, I I paid more tax. So uh, I'm not a fan of evading tax. I'm not trying to tell you to evade taxes, but for a limited company, it's just easier in terms of protection against you. Um, protection for you beg your pardon meaning if there ever was a time that you could not afford to pay the bills of the business your company is liable and you are not liable meaning when your company or your business gets sued you are not being sued as a private individual you are being sued as a company and if the company cannot pay off all they can do is take the business from you but your personal property which is your mortgage or your house that you live in or the TV you have or the little bit of memorable memorable things that you have in your life can still remain even though you lost the business. So personally, I prefer the private limited um, company, which is an LTD. Uh, I prefer that because it just works out better tax-wise and it also means, God forbid, if there ever was a time that the business goes into trouble, you're not liable and you can carry on as normal and not be, uh, be in trouble in terms of your whole life shuts down because you owe money so yeah so first things first register your business that's number one uh register your business as a sole trader register your business as a limited liability company um that's ltd same thing um once that is done i would i am just trying to juggle my brain now once that is done and by the way yeah, if you're thinking where do you register your business uh you just go online on google it's as simple as that if I can remember rightly, if my memory serves me right, um, and I think I'll put a link on the website as well, which is yetiskitchen.com. Um, I'll put the link on there so you can find where to register your, your, your business. Um, it cost me about £14.49 for anybody listening outside of the UK. Um, it's £14.49 um, pounds to register your business um, online, and it's literally sim- It takes less than three minutes. It takes less than three minutes to register the business. Um, So, yeah, it's as simple as that. You go on there, you put your company name that you choose to have. What they will do is they will do a search right there and then to search if any other company has a name with that same, and any other company exists with that same name. If there's no other company that exists with that same name, fine, you proceed. uh, Or it will tell you to choose another name. Um, Once that is done, you pay your fees. They would tell you the option of um, emailing you the company's incorporation documents or you could pay to have a physical copy. Initially, when I started out um, in this entrepreneurial journey, um, I would ask for a physical copy because it just made me feel good. I could laminate it, put it in the frame, put it up on my wall, feel very um, legitimate. But um, yes, um, I run Yancy's Kitchen now and I definitely don't have a physical copy. 
it's all electronic and I could always print it off with a local printer in my house. So I think totally depends on what makes you tick, what's a priority to you. Do you want to see the, 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 the physical paper and remind yourself why you're doing this? If that, if that makes you feel better, sure. And if you don't need the personal paper, uh, just have it emailed to you. So that's that. That's that covered. So once you've registered your business on any of these websites that I'm going to list on yetiskitchen.com, um, the next thing you need to do is, oh, so you've registered your business. The next thing you need to do is contact your local, local council. Contact your local council. So once you register your business, you need to make sure that you have the company number to hand. I think quite a few people would ask you for that. So it might be something you want to save on your phone, save it on the notepad on your phone. So you always have that to hand. Um, it just makes it easier because it's just easy. And next thing you want to do is definitely open a bank account. Uh, so first thing is register your business online using Google. Just type in register your business UK and you'll see a list, list of links come up. After you've done that, the next thing you want to do is open a bank account with your company name. And at the process of opening the bank account, they would ask you that, um, what's your company number? And that's what I meant by you need the company number. They'd ask you what the company number is. You put in the company number, you, you put in the name of the company. It would ask you for how long has the company been open for? You put it in 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, because that's how long it took you to register the company. Uh, yeah, put in 25 minutes and you just get on with it. And um, I, I would give you a bit of advice here again, just a segue, just a segue, a little, little digress, digression from the initial point of this podcast. Um, initially, I, I don't know, I don't know. Initially, I had problems with uh, registering my business with the top banks in the UK because they just were so long-winded and they made everything so strenuous. It, it was long-winded, tiring. Um, the registration process online for a business with Lloyd's, Halifax, whatever, the main major banks that you know on the high street was pretty simple. It took about five minutes or 10 minutes to register with them. But what I found is in the long run, because I typically, I'm somebody that I don't, I'm not a fan of shopping. That's just me. And this goes back to me being a private individual. Uh, I'm not a fan of shopping. So what you would expect is because I'm not a fan of shopping, what I usually do is I shop online instead. But then I would shop online for my business with a business card, with, with, with the business card, and lo and behold, wake up the next morning, and I'm not going to mention the name of the bank, just to make sure that I, I'm not, um, yeah, getting them in trouble or losing them any customers. But what I found is by the time I wake up the next morning, I'll find out that my account is locked or has been blocked because they apparently don't uh, recognize the internet transaction that took place last night. So I would typically call thinking it's all well and good. So I'll call the bank and then explain to them that I tried processing the transaction last night. I thought everything was fine. Woken up this morning and then realized my, black, my, my bank card has been blocked. So what they would then tell me is, okay, we need to put you, we need to ask you some security questions. Um, yeah, we need to ask you some security questions. And depending on how you answer the security questions, we could then take the block off. I'll be like, yeah, sure, okay, what 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 is well, what are the security questions? And what I found where they were actually asking questions in, in, intentionally so you could fail it. So there's a difference between customer service and customer traps being set for you. So the whole point of them trying to make sure that you fail the D DPA data protection that they go through, the whole point of that is to make sure that you physically come into the bank and you show your passport or you show your ID to them. And that way there's less liability on the banks. You can't say you physically came to show your passport for a transaction on your account. And then a week later you call to say, oh my God, there was a fraudulent withdrawal on my account they would have proof to show you that a week ago you came in with your passport and that's why we lifted the lock on your account so for me it was just going through the process of calling them and they assumed and you would assume they're there to help you call them and tell them that it is a lock on your account and they'll tell you okay that's not a problem that's fine we'll just ask you a few questions but I'm, I'm not even gonna lie the kind of questions they typically asked me were what date did you open your account? Of course I don't know what date I opened my account. Yeah, 
It's like me trying to remember the day I, I physically opened it online on the internet. I, I physically can't. If you ask me what month, if you ask me what month, I could probably tell you October 2018. But by the time you ask me what date, I can't say if it's the 11th or the 14th. So automatically, I was going to fill the DPA, the, the list of questions you're going to ask me to verify who I am. And that means they would then send me to the bank and say, unfortunately, we've not been verify your identity over the phone. Can you please go into the branch with your ID to prove who you are? And then we'll be able to take the lock off. You get to the branch, they take the, they see your ID, they then take the lock off and then send you back home. You carry on with your business, but you're now in fear of having another, processing another internet transaction. So it, I literally constantly did that. I was trying to go on holiday. I booked a ticket for 600, 600 pounds um, because it was a business trip. And guess what? Next day, my account was blocked again. I went on, my, I went, I went on a business trip because I just really couldn't be bothered just to keep on going to the bank. Got back from, from, from the business trip only to find out not only had they locked my account, now they've frozen any internet transactions going forward. So initially when they lock it, it means you can't take any money out. But at least online, you can uh, transfer money online. But now it's a matter of you can't even move any money because they've waited on you for so long and you still not come to them with your ID and you've not called them on the phone. So now they're going to just totally freeze your account. So I was like, you know what, fine. And I'm trying to make this short. So I was like, you know what, fine. I think I need to go with another provider. Um, and then I decided to go with Cash Plus. Um, I would have to unfortunately mention the name of the bank here. I decided to go with Cash Plus because I thought to myself, they're pretty easy. It's literally less than 30 seconds to register a bank account with them. I paid £60 for the whole year. When I was registering with these other banks that I mentioned, which is Lloyd's and all these other um, Lloyd's, Halifax, any of these other banks, registering with them was perfectly fine. You didn't need to pay for a business account. Um, but with Cash Plus, you had to pay. And I said to myself, you know what, for the convenience of sitting in my house and I don't have to go to, to any business manager. Oh, Lloyd's business managers were, were, were a blessing in disguise, really. Um, and I say that on the contrary. So, open an account with Cash Plus and lo and behold, I thought it was easy. I paid £60. Let's get the ball rolling. Only for when I want to withdraw some money from the cash point, I'm getting charged two pounds. So if I took out four pounds, they'll charge me two pounds. If I received any any incoming transaction, especially international, and as you can imagine, as a business, Yeti's Kitchen, as a business, we we, we receive lots of money from third party um, vendors who we uh, third party vendors. I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples. Third party vendors like um, Uber Eats, Just Eat, Deliveroo. Or whoever's paying us, you know, somebody might be paying us for catering services and whatever. So we have a, a lot of money people are paying into the account. So what I'm saying is for these different transactions, some of them are international, some of them are local. And what you find is for every international transaction that goes into the account, I found that they were charging me 15 pounds for every international transaction. Um, I didn't, I thought that was extortionate. 15 pounds for every interna inter international trans transaction that took place people pay me money and then you take 15 pounds um and at that time it definitely wasn't making a lot of money i'm talking about i got paid six pounds as an international transaction because i was offering a lot of deals and offers online to boost the business here at his kitchen and what i found was some and again international transaction of six pounds come through into my account into the business account lo and behold i'm being charged 15 pounds for a six pounds transaction so as you can see then it meant that whatever money was in the account in the account from a different transaction was actually being used to pay off an international transaction that was never up to 15 pounds so all i have to say is choose wisely the, the reason i've gone into that in-depth story is choose wisely on who you want to open a bank account with because they're just a pack of wolves as soon as you're a business they want your blood, literally. They want your blood. I think there'll be another podcast on things to avoid as a business because I, I have a story and a half on the woes and the tears that I've cried <laughs> trying to set up a business and how many people have messed me out, with electricians, plumbers, everything. So that's a different conversation for a different day. So definitely open a bank account with any bank you want to. Um, make sure you register your business. Um, register your business name that's number two that's number two so two things there and then number three once you've done that 
certainly contact your local council. No, um, before you contact your local council, make sure you carry out a level two food and hygiene certi certification course. Level two food and hygiene certification course. Course. Um, yeah, make sure you put that, make, make sure you get that done. Um, as of 2018-2019, that, that is the requirement in the UK to sell food to members of the public. You must have a minimum of a level 2 food and hygiene certification course. Um, personally, I would say you also need to get the St. John's Ambulance first aid course covered as well because at the end of the day you, you might have employees or you might decide not to have employees meaning you're planning to expand from home but definitely um make sure you get the st john's just just for your own sake because you might have somebody on the street that collapses and stuff you just need to know what you can do towards help humanity so definitely get that done so st john's ambulance first aid course and level two food and hygiene uh a certification course if you want to run a business and by the way these same principles that i discuss in this podcast is exactly the same steps you need to follow to run a restaurant it's nothing different the only difference is the size of the space you're planning to use so if you're planning to run it from home these are the steps you need to follow if you're planning to run it from a building that you've rented or your building that you bought same principles apply nothing different the only difference is the the council the environmental health officers when they come to inspect your premises or inspect your house that you live in, when, when I believe, I believe, this is just me speaking from my perspective, when they come to your domestic dwelling, they're not as stringent and up your ass as if you were in a premises that you're renting. I think then they're very anal in their approach, making sure that you serve the community great food and healthy food that's not going to poison or get somebody dead really so that those are the only two differences running a business from home and running a business from a premises outside of your home so yeah so for, so next thing is get your certification done and when you might be thinking of certification i've heard many women that i speak to complain about oh my god i've got to do an exam level two certificate i'm not gonna lie i did it one day i sat my ass down 9 a.m in the morning in front of the computer went through all the training watching all the videos falling asleep drinking some more coffee sat down and by 5 p.m i don't know how long the videos are but if you were thinking about where where do you go for this um level two cage uh, food and hygiene course i did mine with virtual college and all of these details like i said once more will be provided on yetiskitchen.com i did mine with virtual college um pretty cheap i think about 15 pounds not even expensive um and it's a multiple choice exam which makes it easy for those who are not um, brainy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so multiple choice exam. Went through the whole lot of videos. And then at the end of the day, at 5 p.m., did my exam. I passed. And then, of course, as usual, they, I had the option of, do they send you a certificate? Or do they just email you that you've passed? I even needed the fiscal certificate. I think you have that option. I'm not sure anymore. But as of 2017, 18, 19... You, I think you have the option of emailing you the certificate or you have a physical certificate. But I personally opted for the option of printing the certificate in this instance because I needed to show it to the environmental health officers that would visit my home or visit my restaurant. So there goes that one. So get that course, um, get that course and certification done once you have your name on the seal and you're happy and verified. Um, just to give anybody a heads up again, if you're planning to run a restaurant, they would hopefully the environmental of health officers would be very impressed if you have a level three food and um, food and hygiene safety food food and hygiene certificate they'll be a lot more impressed than a level two but I currently have only a level two because I have a lot of things that I'm doing at the moment um, I do a lot for my business and as we expand I definitely I'm, I'm a geek so I love love getting certifications not just because I want to get plaques or anything but I am I'm very much a perfectionist so if the environmental health officers want these certifications I will get it for them just to keep them happy because you keep them happy they will keep you happy and you definitely don't want to be on their wrong side so definitely give them anything they want just to keep everybody happy so I'm hoping I can I don't think I can I, I think I might have to do a part two part two to this because it's already 24 minutes on this um, podcast 
and I'm sure you guys don't want to have an hour's podcast <laughs> and fall asleep. <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, there, there, there you go. Um, all I can say is, once you're done with that certification, you can then contact the council. So whenever you just, um, wherever you live in the UK, wherever you live in the UK, um, just type it in. So for for Yessie's Kitchen, we're based in. I think Salford. Yeah, Salford City Council. Salford City Council is where we're based. So I think that you can always go to the local council's website. If you don't know your local council's website, just say local council for where I live, for where I live. Type that into Google and Google will probably ask you for your postcode and then it should tell you what postcode, what council your postcode belongs to. And then once you know what council your postcode belongs to, you could then type into Google again, environmental health office Salford City Council if that's where you live and then it will tell you what's the contact details for the environmental health um, team in the council or the area you live so definitely the environmental health um, office team where you live that would be in charge of giving you a star rating on your restaurant and this is usually you could start business before they come to inspect your premises or your home you can normally uh, start business but um you definitely need to let them know that you're planning to start the business that's all you need to know just let them know that you're planning to start the business you give them a date uh once you provided them with that they would typically respond maximum one week i don't think they take long maximum one week and after one week they'll respond to say okay thank you for letting us know that you're planning to start a business from home uh, you can now begin trading if you told them you're planning to start immediately. Obviously, if you told them you're planning to start in four months' time, they obviously would not say you should start trading. So they'll probably say, okay, good to know that you're planning to start trading. And all the best with your trading, start it, and we will be in touch to inspect very shortly. They would not give you the date of their inspection, by the way. If you're a restaurant, they would not give you a date to tell you when they would visit you. It would be impromptu. It could be any time during your opening hours if you're a domestic premises meaning you're running the business from home in regards to that they would definitely tell you in advance they would normally tell you in advance what day they're visiting because as you can imagine it's a family home and if it's not a family home it's just your house so they can't just arrive at your premises or your house to say they can't just arrive at your house to say that they are coming to have a look at your house and your kitchen and how you run the business from home so they kind of need to let you know they need to let you know how on what date they'll visit so normally they send you an email to say hi yeti we're planning to visit your house on this date and time please confirm if you're available you would obviously respond to say you're available or not available maybe you're away on holiday let them know let them know if you're available and if you're not available let them know what date you're available and what time and they'll come around on that day so which is what i mean by it's a lot easier for domestic premises because and when i say domestic premises for people that don't understand what that is it means your house it's easier for domestic premises because you at least you get a heads up so meaning that you can prepare everywhere is clean your fridge is clean your sink is clean your floor is clean food is stored away properly there's records of the food all of that stuff so yeah you have a lot of time to prepare compared to if you're a business and your customers have literally you've had a lot of orders on a given day and your customers have made a huge mess in front there's food everywhere it's just imagine they then walk in at that time it's not going to be a good look because of course then you're going to get one star and um, that could probably get you closed down as a business so i think it's pretty unfair with domestic premises but hey it's it's privacy they have to they have to respect your privacy so that's that that's that so contact your local council send them an email you can call them but i don't think they'll pick up send them an email tell them you're planning to start a business now or plan, planning to start a business in future once that is done and covered you then wait for their response Now, this is where it begins to get interesting because now you might decide to use any of the third-party suppliers that I mentioned. Um, Third-party delivery fulfillment. I I think that's the best way I can call them. That's the best thing I can name them as. Delivery fulfillment services. You know, um, you could either go on Just Eat, go on Deliveroo, go on Uber Eats, 
Um, just Eats is definitely my, 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 my preference. But I have all three devices. I have all three devices um, in Yeti's kitchen for all three companies. Um, but yeah, that's my, Just Eats is my preference because they've been around before the new guys overeating just um, deliver arrived. So they've definitely got their business model very tight and by no means are Uber Eats or uh, Deliveroo a competitor because I think Just Eat is just miles ahead, miles ahead in terms of database and how much how much control they have over the marketplace, market share. But um, yeah, so that's one thing you should bear in mind. So once you're done with your local council, then you'd need to contact um, any of these vendors, Just Eat, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, contact any of them and let them know that you're planning to run a business from home um they would ask you um do you have a menu so at this point you need to say yes and i'm hoping before you make this call you would have put together a menu for yourself if you're not graphic design inclined you could always uh, just type it out in an email type out in an email your menu and then send it to them by email they'll give you an email address you send it to them and then they would do the job of putting the menu on their website i once had a lady ask me as well she asked me oh she's not good with computers as well so she's not just graphically designed so she did not design a flash she, she did not know how to design a flyer a, a menu a flyer with a menu on it she said oh she doesn't really know how to use computers and my answer for her at that point was you might need to learn because there's only so much you can outsource as a small business. There's only so much you can outsource as a new business. And if you're constantly in a place where you, you to, to get your business running, you're waiting on other people, I think that's a recipe for a disaster, really. And that goes back to what I said in terms of I might have to do another podcast, another podcast detailing the stress and the pain I went through to get this, um, to get Yeti's Kitchen started. But yeah, um, if you don't know how to use a computer, then yeah, go. you don't have to go learn. There are many courses online that um, show you how to use a computer and how to, how to use email and how to just get basic things done. And the way the world is going now, it's definitely a necessity. It's almost as good as a basic necessity of food, shelter and clothing. I think food, shelter, clothing and IT skills. And I don't mean just using your phone. I mean basic things as sending an email drafting a letter, drafting a proposal, these are things you need for your business. Yeah, so that's covered. So once you're done and dusted with contacting Just Eat, they'll ask you one prominent question that they definitely ask, and I think to me, it's the yes or no question because what they're trying to figure out is if they wanna do business with you or not. One question that I always say to restaurant owners and people that want to run a business from the food business from home is they would ask you, are you renting your property or are you the owner of the property? I'm going to say this again because this is where I normally give advice to lots of women. And unfortunately, they skip over this bit and get excited with every other bit which is they contact the council they get the exam done and then they go to just eat and say yes they are renting the property and then just eat will tell them we can't have you on our platform and literally you've done all that work and now you have to do the legwork of marketing your business from home without them oh on just eat i can probably say there's over twenty thousand homes and i'm sure that's just a very bad estimate there's over twenty thousand homes registered on just eat so i don't know what, what kind of marketing you what you intend to do that would reach out to over twenty thousand, where you could have your home business listed to over twenty thousand homes in the uk well twenty thousand homes in the district or just the local area you're in and you want to give out flyers to twenty thousand homes and you think that everyone's going to read that flyer most of our attention is now on our mobile phones based on 20, 2017 and 2018. You definitely don't want to be doing flyers and relying on, 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 on sales from a flyer. So I would advise you to listen to what I just said again in this podcast, which is be careful about telling them that you rent your, pro, your, your house. If you tell them you rent your house, they would ask you for a proof from your landlord to show that he's happy or she's happy for you to sell food from the premises 
And I think the council would also might get a bit funny with you because then they're going to be asking about proof and are you subletting? And then it gets really a bit messy. So I'm not saying it's not it's a bad thing to be renting. Not everybody's a homeowner in the UK. I totally get that. But I'm just saying you might want to cover the, the, the dot the I's and cross the T's by making sure you've informed your landlord you're going to be selling food from home. And I, I make them understand that selling food from home doesn't mean your whole house is going to be smelling of curry. There's nothing wrong with curry, by the way. I, I make curry go in Yeti's kitchen, so there's definitely nothing wrong with the curry it's, it, as a spice or as food. But sometimes landlords could say, oh, then the whole house is going to deteriorate in, in really really quickly because it's one thing to have a nine to five where you're hardly ever home you come home you have a shower and you go to bed that house look pristine for the next five years versus if you're running a business from home the walls there's a lot more cooking being done there could possibly be there's a higher risk of fire there's a higher risk of fire because you know you're cooking more often you're having more people visit the premises it could probably be more, more a higher case of debt i'm um, sorry of, of robberies taking place on your premises because now somebody your neighbors are seeing you're making money or they're seeing there's a lot of traffic from your house and i don't mean traffic in terms of cars but you've got a delivery driver coming in every 30 minutes to your house to deliver stuff or to pick up food to deliver so a neighbor can get frustrated at the fact that there's a car constantly zooming off and zooming back in so there's a lot to consider when you're running this food business from your home it's not impossible but make sure that you've thought about these things before you get excited about the money that could possibly be made. Um, how much money did I typically make? Considering that I had a 9 to 5, this is way back in Milton Keynes. Considering I had a 9 to 5, and what I did is I, I ran the restaurant in my home from 6 till 10. So I, I used to be in IT as a business analyst. Um, and then I worked my way up as a scrum master. If you don't know what that is, Google it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I worked my way up as a scrum master and yeah, found myself that, you know what, I definitely don't want to do IT for the long run, um, but definitely food is something I, I make every day, something I enjoy. I love experimenting. So why not cook, but make sure I overcook the food in terms of if I'm just cooking for two people and I begin to cook for six, seven people and then the leftovers from the from, 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 from the two people, the, instead of just being in a place where they're in the fridge for the rest of the week, know that I could sell them and I have some extra bit of income. So I ran it from 6 till 10 p.m. Um, Monday to Saturday. Um, but yeah, on average, I was making approximately 100 pounds a day. I was making approximately 100 pounds a day. So that was a, that, that was a clean, clean income, considering I was doing IT 9 to 5, and then just within 6 to 10, within four hours a day, I was making 100 pounds. So, so some people might think that's small, but to me, it was major because it was minimal effort and maximum profit for me. Um, that, that was approximately paying off my mortgage if you think about it it was paying off my mortgage for me so it, it was exciting it was exciting but it, it had the opportunity to grow but it was paying me more so i gave it up and focused on it and went back to it again when i moved over to northampton um and once more gave it up focused on it again and now i'm in manchester from northampton and i'm definitely not giving it up this time because nothing good comes to those who keep giving up <laughs> yeah so there you have it there you have it so um make sure you understand uh based on what i've just explained to you make sure you understand the consequences of mentioning to them that you're renting the premises or if you're not renting the premises you're telling them um, that you own the premises they are a lot more favorable to you once you tell them you own the premises they literally have no more questions they'll immediately send you a contract you sign it to tell them that you're happy for them to take as at when i was in milton Keynes, they charged 13 percent i think i don't know 11 percent or 10 percent per transaction that's what justy charged for me to be on their platform for them to list me as a restaurant or whatever just list, just list my business on their platform they, they charge 11 percent commission per transaction um so for example i i don't know math so don't judge me on this <laughs> like don't even don't don't, don't even don't, don't yeah i'm not I'm, I'm not the person to do to do maths with you but um let's say uh, 20 pounds yeah yeah let's say 10 pounds let's say 10 pounds if you had a 10 pound order they'll take a pound a pound 10 Somebody tell me I got that right in the comment section on yetiskitchen.com. If I got that right, then damn, like, yeah, my math teacher, well done then. 
But if I got that wrong, just say, well done, Yeti. You're, you're doing a lot of cooking. It's only fair that you don't know maths. So, that, <laughs> so yeah, let me off. Let me off easy. So, um, yeah. So, they'll be a lot more favorable to you if they know that you run the business from a house that you own. If you say you rent it, they might. I've had a lady who came back to me to say, oh, my God, I told them I rented it. And what she had to do was she had to tell them, she had to show them a proof, a letter from a landlord to prove that he's happy for her to use the premises. She also needed to take photographs of her kitchen, the front of the house, the back of the house, ETC. So they needed to see in terms of is the house clean. So I, I'd imagine that's what they wanted photographs for. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so the, and then obviously her tenancy agreement, they wanted to see that. Uh, so I think those are the only three they asked for. So it's not like all bad if you tell them you're renting, but as long as you're willing to take photographs, as long as you're willing to um, sh- get your landlord to agree. If you go, the landlord's not going to agree, then wait, there's no point in having this conversation. Go find a premises that you can use to sell food. And um, you might be thinking, oh, it's going to cost a, an arm and a leg to find premises. But actually, people use hired kitchens. You could just hire a kitchen in, 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 a, in a premises that's not yours. Uh, for example, many factories out there um, that you could go to, I could just hire a little unit that's like a square. And you just fit a kitchen, sorry, fit a sink there, put a cooker there, and just get the basics done. And I'll probably say we're probably thinking I'm looking at £2,000, £2,000 to get it started if you want to if you if you definitely don't want to if you don't own a house if you don't own a house um yeah you could always hire a kitchen outside so hire a kitchen and then you put your local area and then it would right move all these different places would typically list the commercial property so you can just write commercial property in google commercial property commercial kitchen for hire just write that in google and you'd have a list of um kitchens or properties I use as a business so this is different from a restaurant in terms of hiring a kitchen because then you're in a place where it's only takeaway where you use that kitchen and the um, environmental health officers will come and inspect that kitchen as a as a kitchen used for cooking rather than as a space where customers can come in and go out so it's two different things so yeah it's going to be easier rather than the, 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 the stringent red tape they make restaurants go through so um yeah that's just eat and it's pretty similar for the other platforms uber eats deliveroo um pretty similar they'll ask you are you the homeowner how long have you been living in the address blah 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 um send them your proof of id you need to send them your passport or your driver's license anything to prove your name you need to send them i think you need to send them a utility bill to show that you live on that that address yeah, I think so. I think you need to send them a utility bill to, to show proof, to prove that you live in the address. And I think that's it, literally. So they would email you the contract. You read it. You can sign it using an online electronic signature. Once you've done that, um, what they would normally ask, one other thing, you need to keep um, pay attention to this part, is they'll normally say they can't sign you up to their platform except you're three weeks away from opening. So you, there's no point that you there's no point of calling them in January to tell them you're planning to open your home as a as a food business open a food business in your home in June and you're calling them in January they're not going to listen to you they're going to say you need to call us three weeks you need to call us three weeks before you open and then we're able to activate um this form that we need to send you and send you they will then send you an ipad looking item that's the best way i can call it because definitely it doesn't look like an ipad it looks like a tv screen with a huge um back end but yes yeah, so all of the pictures of what this looks like will be on the website yes um yeah so yeah um they'll send you an ipad literally within three four days you get it in the post and that's where you can receive your orders they'll send you these or- orders you receive it you click on accept or decline so for example if a customer orders something that you don't have uh, just click on decline but of course they're going to penalize you for that in terms of your your restaurant listing on their website would not be as prominent you will not be number one for example if somebody's looking for african food in the salford area which is wherever you live you sort of you coming up as number one you might be number 19 on the list meaning you're probably not gonna many people are not interested in scrolling all the way down so 
whatever you do as a home as a business as a restaurant as a kitchen commercial kitchen avoid the decline button so and then there's options if you don't have a certain food that's available on your menu and it's no longer available you could that same ipad you could just click on it and take an act you can take an item off them off line you can take an item offline and that puts you in a place where when a customer orders it when a customer tries to order it it's not available for the customer to order that's a lot better and that helps you reduce the, the, the chances of you selecting the decline button when an order comes through so yeah it's just pretty simple they'll send you an ipad uh they'll send you a sign to say um to say oh i'm now open um it's pretty easy you don't have to pay for the ipad by the way can i give you i'll just give you the heads up yeah just to give you a heads up you don't have to pay for the ipad um it's free apparently but i've put, got to put a disclaimer on that it's not really free because um uh, they charge you 800 pounds as i when i was in milton keynes which is quite a few years ago um when i was in milton keynes around about 2015 2014 when i wanted to join it was 600 pounds it was 600 pounds and now 2018 when i joined them again it's now 800 pounds to get the ipad off them but they don't they, they you don't pay them up front what they do is when you start receiving orders for delivery or collection so it's not because i'm a restaurant i'm allowed to have a collection from my restaurant and delivery to people's homes what they what they do is for every order you get if it's not if it's been paid by card if the customer selected to pay by card they take all of that money till they get to 800 pounds that you owe them so that's what they mean by you don't pay them for the ipad it's free but you owe them 800 pounds and they'll keep taking money from you from your orders till they get to 800 pounds but if if um you're in a place where a customer selects to pay by cash you get to keep the cash and there's no way you could control what the customer chooses by the way so you might be thinking oh I'll have my customers pay me by cash every time there they'll place the order online and I'll just I'll I'll take the option for card offline you can't do that um yeah so the customer chooses what they can they they, they want to so yeah they send you the iPad maximum 3 4 days you get it you put it up connect you you need to make sure you have internet connection the iPad needs internet connection um yeah the iPad needs internet connection Once you have internet connection connected iPad then you need to call them to say you've got the iPad and connected internet they'll take you through the setup stage to show you what you need to do what buttons you need to click maximum 10 minutes phone call and obviously by this point you would have sent them your menu so they obviously would have put the prices up on their website for you they I think they used to in 2015 when I used to run it from Milton Keynes they used to have the option of um making a website for you and it used to be free um but i'm not sure if they still do that so that's part of the things you might need to ask them because it's good as a business to have a website so at least your customers know where to find you um and i i'm i'm trying to finish i've got literally th- less than 5 minutes left uh before this recording stops and then the other thing you need to do is um definitely have a contact number um if you can't afford to get a website it's fine yeah it's totally fine Uh, especially when you're running it from home as a restaurant you have no excuse you shouldn't be a restaurant and you don't have a website that's that's appalling if that that that's that's shocking but if you're looking for somebody to build your website you know how I do you know how I do <laughs> I build websites too so if you go to the www.yetiskitchen.com website I built it in collaboration with somebody else um but yeah I I I'm constantly changing that website The next task for me to do is to actually um, put up a shopping cart so you can actually buy stuff and we deliver it to you and that way I'm less reliant on just eat. But that's for the future. Um that's for the future. Um, but uh, I build websites so if you need your website built and I'm not in got my hands full with cooking, definitely hit me up, hit me up tsg.smallgirl.com and uh, you get to see all the different websites that I've built and all the other things that I do. Um yeah so build a website if you're a restaurant you can't avoid it you shouldn't be a restaurant it should be part of the things that the environmental health officers look out for before they let you sell food <laughs> Um as you can see that beep you heard is an order from Uber Eats so that's exactly how it works 
I will take a picture at a later stage. Um, not sure. I'll take a picture right now. As you can see, I'm multitasking. Um, yeah. So, just taking a picture so I can show you. Anyone listening? So, yeah. You just make sure. Okay, good. We're still, I'm, st I'm still here. So, always make sure that you... I've forgotten where I was now. What was I saying? Yeah, make sure you have a website. Make sure you have a website for what you are doing. You have a website. And if you're a small business running from home, it's not really important. Just focus on trying to build your business. Uh, but you must have a phone number. Um, what I did, and I still do right now in Yeti's Kitchen is... Um, you can have a mobile number and right now uh, Yeti's Kitchen's phone is actually a pay as you go so I'm not actually not interested in the contract I have a really crappy Samsung phone I'm not gonna name what phone it is I have a really crappy Samsung phone it's a smartphone um, but it's a very old one it's about seven eight years old um, but what it does is it works it works man it works it's a crappy Samsung phone and it's a pay as you go phone so what I did is I went on to virtual landline Yep, part of the list, um, part of the links I'll put up up on the yetiskitchen.com. I went into virtu um, virtual landline, signed up for a landline so that I could have an 0161 number. And what it does is it reroutes any call to the 0161 number to my mobile phone. Not my personal mobile phone, but my business mobile phone. So by default, and any calls that come into that mobile phone, I respond or my members of staff respond saying, Yeti's Kitchen, how can I help? Right? So obviously you don't want to come into your personal mobile phone and you're like, hello. Yeah, that's not going to look very professional. So, and yeah, how much did that cost me? That cost me six pounds per month. Yeah. So I don't know what BT are doing, what Virgin are doing, charging people 60 pounds, 49 pounds per month for a business line. Come on guys. We're in the 21st century. We're, we're, we're in the, in the century of internet and, and, and people that shop online and compare prices all the time. So you can't be charging 60 pounds for something that yeah that's just extortionate so virtual online make sure that you make sure that you register with them if you want a landline i think it looks more professional rather than just eat listing your phone number on the on their website as an 079 number or your mobile phone number it looks more professional when it's an 0161 number or a landline it just looks better for you um but i would have to wrap up this podcast at this point um i if i remember anything else but that's definitely not the plenary of it so um register with virtual landline you have a mobile phone that you can use to receive your orders customers can call you just you can call you you have your menu and you go online and you start making money and of course you need to provide them with your bank details that's why i told you to register your bank register your register and open a bank account your business bank account in the beginning of this podcast once you've done that you provide them just eat with your bank account details and they'll pay you weekly they'll pay you weekly by direct uh, transfer and there you go there you have it there you have it so for me it's literally that simple it's that simple to get a business started from home a food business from home and i personally don't think i think the next podcast might go into more detail on what the environmental health officers are looking for um, to give you a one star or a five star I think that's what I'll cover um, but that's it how to set up a business food business from home I'm your girl Yeti Sabai that's my name but my personal brand is TSG that small girl you can find me at my <laughs> food hub in Manchester Greater Eccles um, Greater Manchester Eccles um, just type in Yeti's Kitchen Dot com to find me or if you want to know more about my personal brand and all the bits and pieces that i do it's tsg that small girl dot com until next time take care be safe and just make the world a better place be nice to people and just share some light and share some love take care bye